So welcome everybody. I'm thrilled uh, to have Carol Vandehend uh, here with us this evening. Uh, we've been friends for a long time. I got to see her first book come to fruition, Goodbye Orchid, which was super exciting. And then it got twice as exciting when I heard that the second book, Orchid Blooming, was coming out. Um, she is an international Pulpwood Queens book club pick. Uh, she is delightful. You are based in New York still, yeah? It's actually New Jersey, New Jersey. <laughs> but yes, yeah, close yeah, to New York. New I'm just an hour outside of Manhattan. And that's why the books, a lot of the books take place in Manhattan and New Jersey. This is an area I know well. Okay, great. So what I'd love for you to do is tell us a little bit about that journey, what brought you to the first book and deciding to do the second book, and then tell us what's next for you. And then we can open up to a little bit of Q&A. Yeah, you know, so in terms of how these books came about, I often say the shorthand answer is that they were inspired by combat wounded veterans. And it was during a time that was hard for me and my family. So I'm married, I have twins, and one of the twins was having a bit of a hard time. So I actually turned to writing as a place of solace for myself. I was just pouring my heart out onto the page as a way to make myself feel better. It was actually really effective. But then I found as I was writing the story, and this was the story of Goodbye Orchid, that I wanted to also improve my craft. So I joined writers groups. And this was the seminal moment that allowed me to know that I was actually on a path to publication, not just writing for myself. Here's the story. My particular writing group I joined would meet in person every other Saturday and we would read our work aloud to get feedback. So I'd read the passage in Goodbye Orchid, and Anna, since you've read Goodbye Orchid, you're familiar with the passage where Phoenix wakes in the hospital, sees what's happened to himself, and is grappling with this incredible change to his life. And when I read that passage aloud, the emotion that that passage um, evoked among the writers at the table, you know, being able to bring them to tears real made me realize how emotionally powerful the story was and then I started thinking okay then this isn't just about writing for me and my own place of solace but it actually has um, the power to move others and so that's what set me down the path of publication for Goodbye Orchid and then what's interesting after Goodbye Orchid came out and I met readers and book clubs and libraries and people in bookstores readers asked me for more of the story they wanted to know what happened before page one of Goodbye Orchid. Tell us about Orchid and Phoenix. How did they meet that backstory? Because of course you get bits of that in Goodbye Orchid, but they wanted more. And that's how Orchid Blooming came about. And what was so interesting was that writing Orchid Blooming unveiled secrets even to me that I didn't know in advance. So as I was writing and really deep into the characters of Phoenix and Orchid, they revealed secrets to me that I hadn't known before. And that's what you see on the pages of Orchid Blooming. Now, um, what I've also heard from readers is that they want to know more what happens after the last page of Goodbye Orchid. And so back to Sherry's question of what happens at, what, you know, what am I working on next? There's a third in the trilogy coming out in 2023 that is tentatively titled Always Orchid which is also a very beautiful, emotional um, journey that shows character growth and really dives into another, yet another aspect of what I started. You know, when I started, I said that the series is really inspired by combat wounded veterans, which you see in Phoenix accident, which you see with Orchid grappling with PTSD, and will also play a role in the third book, Always Orchid, um, because the homeless man who is such a, a part of the inciting incident of Goodbye Orchid comes back in that third book. And part of homelessness actually um, is something that can happen to military veterans when they come back and they have a hard time finding meaningful work in the civilian world. Um, sometimes it can spiral into that. And so it allows me to explore yet another aspect of combat wounded veterans. Oh, I love that. I had a, a friend who was a writer in one of the writers groups down here, and she had written a brilliant essay about that. Her son had been in the military and then came back and um, she wrote an essay about 
and made it not about her son, but a little bit more general, but it was so beautifully worded. She's a poet. And this essay was just gorgeous talking about basically, you know, you train to become part of a unit and part of a group and to do the things that need to be done militarily. And then you come back and there's nobody to untrain you and deprogram deprogram them so they're so used to that that it's it becomes a huge stressor for a lot of combat veterans and it was so well done and it's it's very true i've known a lot of folks that have come back that have just struggled a lot and there's another um i worked with an author out in california she wrote a phenomenal book um at some point you have to look up her video because it is her book trailer is just I promise you will cry. I have not had anybody watch this trailer that hasn't cried. This book trailer is brilliant. And it's called um, Wounded Warrior, Wounded Wife. And it's about veterans coming back. And it was inspired by her. She was out running, jogging. And she's and she lives out in San Fran. She was jogging across the bridge and a car pulled up next to her. And a guy jumped out and she was worried for her own safety, you know, momentarily because he jumped out next to her ran past her, jumped up onto the bridge and jumped off and jumped off the bridge. And she went, oh my God, what kind of pain, you know, must he have been in? And then she started doing some interviews and really found her story in the essays of all these military wives and girlfriends and husbands of military folks who, you know, nobody buys them a cup of coffee or asks how they're feeling or anything. And she started a whole foundation behind it and everything for wounded warrior, wounded wife. But it's such a it, it's such a thing that I think that we all grapple with and probably aren't doing enough to to credit these folks. So I love that you're shining a light on that. Mm-hmm. And I love that he's coming back in the third book. That's that's fantastic. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Is that Barbara mm-hmm. McNally, the um author you were just talking about? Yes. Yeah, I know her. She actually yeah. blurbed Goodbye Orchid. Okay. She endorsed she's it. Delightful. Yeah, she's she, delightful. Yeah. Yeah. Really amazing the work she does. Yeah. Good lady. I like her a lot. Yeah. A lot of fun. All right. So how long did this book, the new one, take compared to the first one? Did it did it kind so, of flow out of you at that point or? I mean, luckily my uh time to market is getting a little faster because the first one was a lot of years. Yeah. <laughs> and the second one, it's been two years. So Goodbye Orchid came out at the end of 2020. And okay. now just under two years later, Orchid Blooming is out. Part of what helps that is that, um, well, yes, I mean, getting up the learning curve after having a debut novel come out certainly helps. But also some of that backstory had been already, some of it had been written. And of course, a lot of it was in my mind to be able to know the backstory of the characters to be able to write Goodbye Orchid meant that some of the content was there. Yeah. Um, but I do feel like things are getting faster because the third book, um, being able to go from first draft to now the stage of editing I'm in is was about a year and a half. It's been about a year and a half. So yeah, that'll probably be two years also by the time it comes out. But at least the time between Orchid Blooming and Always Orchid will be less than a year. So that you know, the speed is getting there. (laughs) Did you, how did um, the pandemic affect you and your writing and your books? I mean, as so many authors have probably seen, because my book came out at the end of 2020, launch was really mostly virtual. I did have a book club from a friend who lives nearby in New Jersey, invited me over. We were outdoors in her backyard. So we were able to do that. But most of the events were just like this, you know, over Zoom. And you were so kind to host me right back in 2020 also. And your name. still liked Zoom a lot, right? (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) that's right. Because they needed the interaction. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Yeah. And Uh, now people might be Zoomed out. Did you you write a lot of the next book during pandemic? Yes. So, so much of the writing you took place during the pandemic. Okay. And just, you know, I think I've. You might know this already, but you are in the acknowledgments. Oh, yes. So if you look in the back of Orchid Blooming, your Aww. name is in there for being, Thank you, you so know, much. such a great supporter. Oh, yeah. That's I'm delightful. very grateful. That's delightful. Well, we love gorgeous books and uh, especially love. Okay. So they say that you can't judge a book by its cover, but 
trust me, people do. <laughs> well, do. So much of our brains are visual. It definitely yeah. makes sense that people yeah. pay attention to the visuals. Absolutely. And for those of you who don't know, you know, Carol is also a marketing genius. And so she did a, a piece for my other company for Where Writers Win, a series of pieces actually for our blog there, talking about that branding and the consistency and the branding. And, and you know, I have a lot of authors that, change their cover things because of that because they were doing a series and didn't have that that cohesion you know between covers between the branding and stuff so you're very helpful to them so yeah oh happy to hear it and I love speaking at writers and publishing conferences and it's yeah. now you know and that's where you and I first met was at a conference yeah and so I think it's been eight or ten years now I've been speaking at conferences and really enjoy being able to help authors in that way and right. I'm so proud that this series has won awards for cover design yeah. and also for interior design I'll because see. there are hidden Easter egg design details yes. and I don't know if Anna you have a hard copy um, whether you have a paperback or hard cover and I don't know if you've noticed the little um, hidden Easter egg design detail but the for instance like I'm holding up orchid blooming which has the orchids that um, and the petals are blooming all over the cover and on goodbye orchid the orchids are shattered to represent the physical and emotional shattering of the characters if you look in the bottom right mm -hmm. corner of every page there's a little image of orchids but what's really interesting and what makes it of um kind of an immersive experience is if you flip through the pages and look at that bottom right hand corner the orchids will appear to bloom or to shatter until you get to the deepest part of the story. And then they visually come together for the emotionally satisfying ending. It's like a flip book feature inside of the book um, to add That's just a little extra touch. Really cool. I do have the hard cop copy of uh, Goodbye Orchid. I don't have the, I have a Kindle version of the Orchid Blooming. Yes, you see that flip That's book feature? Neat. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> so clever points for creativity. Yeah, that's the kind <laughs> of makes, stuff. I love those kind of surprises in books. Mm -hmm. It's so delightful. It's yeah. hard for me to wrap my brain around how you can be creative enough to write the books, then go back and have that flip book <laughs> flower <laughs> thing too. That's very, that's a lot of creativity. Right? <laughs> I'm a very visual person, so I really love that we were able to incorporate that. Yes. And um, I have had readers tell me after they have the Kindle version, they're like, you know what? I decided I want the paperback or the hardcover too because of that flipbook feature to be able to have that. And it makes a really beautiful gift. Um, I know people have said they love giving this as a gift because it has all these thoughtful details. Oh, and actually, my mother would love that probably. Mm -hmm. Now the second one, it looks like it's, I'm trying to look at, it looks like it's blooming mm -hmm. and then coming yep. back to. Yeah. Coming come, back to whole. Coming yeah. Back which is so whole. like meaningful. It really follows the character's arcs as well. And then Sherry, if you ever get any orchid blooming hardcovers in your store, yeah. You know how if you take the jacket off a hardcover, normally it's just blue underneath. It's plain. Yes. Um, but in this orchid blooming, if you take the jacket off, the cover is printed underneath as well. It's oh, wow. really beautiful That's in gorgeous. person. It's yeah, stunning. People are doing that. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. All right. I have somebody else joining us now. Gia is joining us. She was in and then she was out and now she's coming back. So very okay, good. good. Yes. I know Gia. She is very That's sweet. Nice. She'd come out to visit me at a books at a library event um, earlier this year. Yeah. So she's a fan as well. And yeah. So what was the most difficult part of this? What's the, been the most difficult part of the whole process for you? Hmm. I mean, it is um, a little bit of a challenge to find time for everything I want to do. So, um, Anna, you and I haven't met before, but I do work full time at Mars Incorporated. I uh, govern our digital transformation. I'm looking after digital for sustainability, and I've had careers in marketing and strategy. On top of that, I have twins. And then I also um, like to give back in the community. So I serve on boards of directors. And actually, I just hit term limits on a board of directors. So I'm looking for my next board role now. And it means that I am really busy with lots of things. 
That's a lot. And so, okay. What is your think, writing? What is your writing habit look like? Do you know, you right now, at night or sporadically or. Yeah, I mean, I love both. I definitely find when I wake up first thing in the morning, that kind of um, period, and maybe everyone can relate to this, you know, that feeling between full lucidity and still being a little bit in dream state, that's like a very creative time. But also late at night can be very creative. It's very freeing. It feels like nobody's, you know, it doesn't matter what you write, you can write anything because, you know, no one, no one's around. And so I think both of those times are really great. I don't have a particular schedule because it's been so busy really getting the word out about Orchid Blooming that I haven't had as much time as I would like to work on book three, but that's definitely what I need to prioritize next. And then also I've been speaking at conferences, which keeps me busy. I was just in uh, Tampa slash St. Pete's Beach okay. right before Ian hit actually. Oh <laughs> and um, that was to speak at Novelist Sync. Yeah, luckily I think the storm ended up going south of them. They it were did. prepared yeah. though. They were well prepared. Yeah, I have a couple of nieces down on Tampa and it totally, totally escaped them because we'd invited them up here and they mm -hmm. said, well, it looks like we're going to be far enough inland where we should be OK. And then everything, of course, went way south of them. And instead they had that weird phenomenon where it was low tide. So everything pulled out up oh. in Tampa. Yeah. So they had lowest tide ever. Like they could have oh. gone mudlarking out there. And the yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Crazy. Oh. Yeah, yeah. opposite of what had originally been predicted, which, of course, is always the way. <laughs> how, do, how does one get to be a weatherman? I think I aspire to be a weatherman in my next life because it's <laughs> the only job that you can do and be wrong like 98% of the time and still have a job. Right? <laughs> uh, uh, you've lived many lives, Sherry. You've had right. lots of interesting... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, lots of interesting professions and experiences. Oh, and oh Lord. So when so tell me what book tours look like for you. Have you for this book now you've been able to get out there and do live appearances? And I have. I've been these last, I think, three weekends in a row. I've been in physical bookstores, signing books for readers, really excited to meet people in person, and then um, had a lovely launch party, and have also been um, going to conferences in person. So Novelist Inc. was in person, um, IBPA, or Independent yep. Public Publishers Association, earlier this year was in person. I know you've spoken at that conference yeah. before, too. So it's really lovely to have the in-person things. I just um, had a book club on Friday night where I went in person to be able to have dinner with the um, book club so much fun yeah oh, I feel like it's making up a little bit for those lost opportunities at the end of 2020 yeah right my gosh it must have been so much fun to have like a live launch party it probably felt like your first book since you couldn't do one live first time out right yeah a lot of this feels like firsts for me and it's yeah. really fun I'm totally loving it and then of course there is still virtual you know there's still virtual activities and lots of podcasts I've been really lucky to um, be invited back to podcasts I've been on before plus to find new podcasts so, um, that's always really fun outstanding very good yeah all right. So does anyone have a question for Carol about the books or any of the characters? Was it harder for you to go after you wrote the, the first book then to go back and recreate the backstory as opposed to going forward from where you left off? Anna, that's such an insightful question. I feel like maybe you're a writer too, because it, <laughs> that is In true. my dreams, yeah. <laughs> there is um, a plotting difficulty, which is you have to stick to 100% consistency with what's in Goodbye Orchid. And so I ended up, as I was crafting Orchid Blooming, needing to go back and check and make sure the details were correct and that the continuity of the story made sense. I um, wonder if you've had this experience, Anna, since it sounds like you read Goodbye Orchid first, and now mm -hmm. you're reading Orchid Blooming and almost done the last half the chapter yeah. left. I'm wondering if you picked up on any... Um, hidden little foreshadowing in Orchid Blooming that um, hinted at what was to come in Goodbye Orchid. And when they're in Paris, they talk about the train and how many people fall on the train tracks. Uh, exactly. For sure. Uh, yes. That one definitely did. Um, yeah. So I think that was part of the plotting to answer your question. You know, that's part of the plotting of Goodbye of Orchid Blooming was to 
to tuck in a little bit of that foreshadowing so that people who've read Goodbye Orchid will be like, oh my gosh, I know what's coming. And some readers yeah. told me that. Or if you haven't read Goodbye Orchid, that's fine too, because then when you read Goodbye Orchid, you'll look back and be like, oh my gosh, I should have seen that coming because, you know, the little um, breadcrumbs and the trail of clues were hidden in there. There was a very subtle one that was in an early chapter in which Phoenix is sitting in his office thinking about his father writing a speech that he's going to give at the Effies, and he momentarily notices the glass case in his office. Yeah. The one she falls through on the other book. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so that was also a little like breadcrumb just to, you know, tuck in a little bit of a hint of what was to come. <laughs> yeah. So that was fun to do. <laughs> well, I think you're very creative. I would be very hard pressed to do what you do. So <laughs> I very much like it. <laughs> oh, you're kind to say so. And thanks for reading both books Um, and, you know, sticking with Orchid and Phoenix Journey. I think that they go through so much and I what I love hearing from readers and tell me what your experience has been the readers often tell me that they feel that their empathy is deepened by seeing what Phoenix and Orchid go through or that they're left with a sense of optimism and hope that if Phoenix and Orchid can go through the challenges they have then you know we can go through so many amazing challenges in our lives too. Do either of those or other feelings resonate for you, Anna? I would say the hope definitely does. Yeah, the feeling of hope that in the end it will all work out the way it's supposed to. Yeah, I mean, I certainly hold that belief and yeah. want that to be true. <laughs> <laughs> so it's wonderful to have the power of the pen to make that make that so. Yeah. <laughs> so who was your favorite character to write then? Oh dear, they're all like, you know, <laughs> part of me. And um, I'd also love to hear from Anna and Gia if they have favorite characters. Of course, I mean, ah, these characters are so meaningful. So Phoenix, like what he goes through, the fact that my initial inspiration was combat wounded veterans going through things like Phoenix went through, of course, he is just part of me. And then um, Orchid, I think a lot of times my friends who read the book say they see bits of me in Orchid because her sense of fashion, her style, her being half Asian. So my twins are half Asian as well. Like there are, there's certainly parts of me in all of these characters. Um, the names of the characters are actually really meaningful, which might be fun to chat about. But I posed a question, so I wanted to, you know, see if anybody wants to answer. Do you guys have a favorite character that you want to talk about? Sometimes I hear Caleb and Sasha. People. I was going to say Caleb. I would like to see more of his story someday. Yeah, I do have to say I have... Um, a little outline in my mind of a fourth book that could really play up Caleb and Sasha because I hear that a lot. I think he's such an interesting character because he feels like he's the black sheep of the family. He thinks he's not lived up to his potential and he thinks he's not as good as his twin brother. But actually, um, although of course Phoenix and Orchid have big character arcs, Caleb has a character arc too. The way in which he rises to the occasion and really supports his brother after the accident uh, makes him such a strong, powerful character. Uh, but then that grappling of, is he good enough? I think that's a really very human and vulnerable um, place for him to be. So well, yeah. I think um, the way other people view him because of the tattoos and all that, those are my people, the, the tattoos and, and the, you know, burly biker kind of looking guys those are the, my ex-husband was that person and um so I I know a lot of those type of people and the way people look at them sometimes that affects their view of themselves too ah oh, tell me more so like people judge them based on how they look and assume that they're a certain way that they're going to be tough and whatever but well, that might not be the case. Yeah, tell me yeah, more. Th think about your bike rallies and, and things like that. They are by far the most charitable and giving people that I've ever been around. But when people look at them, they kind of back off a little bit because they kind of look a little scary. And, you know, little they're all the tattoos and the burly and the bike and all of that kind of stuff 
kind of puts people off a little bit, but those people are probably the sweetest people that you could meet. I and they're very a hundred percent. I had I had a, a group of friends like that too when I was younger and you know my dad owned a pool hall so i would play in a lot of the bars and stuff around chicago and everything and everybody would say oh you go into that place i'm like hey, that's the safest place in the city man hey no one's gonna mess with you with they you know and again right. they were the big i mean teddy bears you know yeah big old, big old teddy bears the larger and meaner and bigger beards they had the the sweeter and softer the, the guys they were <laughs> it really yeah was. yeah and the charities that they that yeah. they contribute to and it's just yeah misconceptions i think yep yep and that's such a theme that um goes through goodbye orchid and orchid blooming like how people judge you based on how you look on the outside versus how you are on the inside because even phoenix experiences that after his accident his accident leaves him you know visibly changed and um, it's unfair the way that people judge him based on that. Um, and Orchid as well, given that she's half Asian, you know, um, and she grapples with that a little bit in terms of her identity, thinking that when she goes to China, that's the place where she's going to fit in because people just see her as Chinese like everybody else there. And she has a big aha. I don't know if you remember that yeah. scene in which in China, but, her, it turns out her coworkers are like, wait a minute, of course we wouldn't mistake you for being Chinese. Yeah, I've been to China and that is, that is really true that they are, you know, it's the same, you don't fit in anywhere, kind of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, Gia, do you want to say hello? So I know Gia and she had, I was just sharing with Sherry and Anna that you would come out to visit me during um, an event, which is so sweet. And so you're welcome if you want to say hello and say anything. Gia, can you unmute yourself? Should be a button on the lower left. And maybe while she's trying to find that button, um, I had mentioned a little bit of the story of the names of the characters since you asked me which characters I enjoyed writing. Yeah. And so each of the names are meaningful and, and feel free if you want to guess too, like Anna, if you, if anything had come to you when you heard that Phoenix was named Phoenix and Orchid was named Orchid, um, feel free to share or I can just share, you know, why I named the characters that way. I assumed Phoenix because he rises from the ashes, basically. But yeah. Why well, I didn't get Orchid. Orchid is much more subtle. And I didn't really know this until, until I started looking into the name. I mean, first of all, orchids are known to be an Asian flower so that, it, you know, suits her um, heritage. But it's, it's actually much deeper than that. So what I learned was that orchids appear to be delicate. They have a reputation for being delicate. And I know myself, I've been given a lot of orchids as gifts as when the books launched. And I'm always scared of killing them. But orchidologists, people who study orchids say in the wild, orchids are actually quite hardy and resilient. And that's so perfect for her character mm -hmm. because Phoenix feels protective towards orchid given the trauma in her childhood. And so he worries that she's delicate and wants to protect her from his accident. But yet in the end, when you see how strong her character is, she proves herself to be hardy and resilient. And so I absolutely love that. Um, that dichotomy to represent her. Hmm. I don't yes. think I have any other questions. So you have another half chapter to finish, Anna, and then please leave reviews. You probably know that reviews <laughs> help other readers find um, stories on Goodreads, BookBub, you know, wherever books are sold okay um, yep that would be will super you be, helpful wh where are you um speaking or going to be appearing next carol so funny enough my next talk on saturday which uh the day after tomorrow is not related specifically to the book it's actually at ascend which is um an asian american business conference okay. i'm speaking on a panel about belonging but actually the books do fit in a bit because there is so much of that theme in the storytelling. So um, I'm looking forward to that. 
the weekend after I'm speaking at um, the Hoboken Book Festival, which is sponsored by the Hoboken Library. The weekend after that, I'm going to be up in Ithaca, New York at Buffalo Street Books, which is um, a beautiful little indie bookstore. And I can't even remember, but I feel like I have, you know, <laughs> lots of events coming up. And then also at Writers, um, I'm speaking, I'm giving writers workshops. So I just gave one at Liberty States Fiction Writers. I yeah. have, I think, Virginia Romance Writers coming up, Georgia Romance Writers. Um, I have a bunch of writers things coming up as well. And I'm booking into 2023. I actually have a number of events already scheduled for 2023, including Pulpwood Queens. Wonderful. Good. Yes. Oh, mm -hmm. good. I'm glad you're going to be there. That's great. Yeah. Will you be there? I will not. I'm going to be in New Orleans the same weekend. So my family oh, is it. taking me for, that's the only weekend that everybody can kind of get away um, in January. And um, <clears throat> that is my, well, my birthday's in December, but we don't try and do anything two weeks before, you know, 10 days before Christmas in December because duh. <laughs> uh, we have a little bit going on here between the bookstore and everything, but we go MLK weekend because we can take an extra day. So it's a big birthday for me. So they're all taking me to New Orleans. We're going to just party in New Orleans. Aww, for a few days. Yeah, that's great. Well, um, early so happy birthday. That's right around the time my husband's birthday. His is December 11th. So it must be okay. 16. The same time. He's a good Sagittarius. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> that's awesome. And how are your boys? <laughs> You know, I can't believe they're 19. Oh um, my God, no. Yeah, just, you know, college aged. Oh my God. <laughs> like, where does time go? It's just oh unbelievable. My goodness, they were like, what, 12 the last time? I, I know, saw? when you, you were right. Yeah. I know, yes. Oh, yes, you had dinner with Carter and yeah. he was just a, like, middle schooler. He was like yeah. a little kid, a skinny little thing. I could pick him up with, you know, one pinky. Oh, <laughs> and now he's six foot three. And wow. like towers over me. Yeah. They're both oh, taller than me, which they won't let me forget. <laughs> well, thank you very much for doing this with us tonight. I want to shut off the recording. Then I want to ask you a couple more questions off, off recording here. So we're going to stop recording.